Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. Time to review the next dino documentary. Well, uh, funny thing, I mixed up Dino King with Tarbosaurus the Mightiest Ever. Tarbosaurus released in 2008 in a more documentary type style. Dino King is more in line with The Land Before Time or The Walking With movie with voice acted dinosaur characters. So let's pretend that I made this video an appropriate six months ago. I won't review Dino King as well because it is more of a goofy kids movie. So the 2008 miniseries follows the life of a Tarbosaurus named Patch. We see him grow up in part one, then struggle as an adult in part two. Before I begin, it is worth mentioning that I am aware how these movies have a fan base who feel nostalgic towards them. As usual, there's nothing wrong with enjoying them, you're free to like what you like, just don't expect me to feel peer pressured into not giving an honest review. I'll always give my honest opinion and try to stick to the facts. So let me be really honest and say, this is terrible. Not only from a filmmaking standpoint, but accuracy wise, this is rough. All around, it felt like the quality you'd get from a bin of straight-to-DVD movies. Yup, this is how we're following up Titanoboa. Alright guys, let's dig this up. Well, I always try to be fair, so I guess we should spend some time with the few and far between positive points to kick things off. Protoceratops, an addition we'll certainly meet again in the negatives, is commonly shown throughout the runtime, and for good reason. It is correctly stated how Protoceratops has been commonly found, well, common for non-avian dinosaurs, with articulated specimens in their original poses, nests, and even clusters of them have been discovered in the Gobi Desert. If someone like the great Nigel Marvin were to go back in time to late Cretaceous Mongolia, I'm sure they would keep stumbling across this famous Ceratopsian. Another interesting point is with the Therizinosaurus and its diet. Again, it's bound to come up again for obvious reasons, however it is correctly shown as an herbivore, just chilling eating some plants. Towards the end of the story though, when Patch's kid runs into it, the Therry gulps him down in one bite. There are too many of them, what are we going to do? If Therizinosaurus were shown to be fully fledged carnivores, this point would fly straight into the negatives. The way this is presented though, it might be possible. Animals in the present day that we know are herbivores will supplement their diets from time to time with meat. You can easily find videos of cows or horses eating chicks. It's creepy to see cuddly herbivores transform into bloodthirsty baby eaters. But we can't think of diets as black and white, herbivory or carnivory. Herbivores can eat meat on occasion, and carnivores can eat plants. Think of it more as a sliding scale of more herbivorous or more carnivorous. Maybe the filmmakers weren't even trying to pull a big brain here, and just thought it'd be cool. Still, I'm not above giving accidental credit. And already we're at the end here. It's good that cannibalism is shown for theropod dinosaurs. We do have direct fossil evidence of theropod tooth marks on members of their own species, as is the case in Majungasaurus and Allosaurus. Majungasaurus has gained a reputation from the shows Planet Dinosaur and Jurassic Fight Club for being a cannibal dinosaur. But really, cannibalism is not the exception, it's the rule. Most, if not all, predatory dinosaurs would have eaten their own kind given the chance. Food is food. This is shown here with an intruding Tarbosaurus hunting a young patch. And that's about it, moving on. Despite all the very obvious problems, not all of them are the creator's faults. For the first time on this channel, we get to meet the lovely Asian Lambiosaurine, Sintosaurus. Since its discovery in the 1950s, it has been long shown bearing this super strange head comb thing. I've seen some weird dinosaurs, but geez, not gonna lie, the jokes basically write themselves. Well, fortunately for the Sintau, and unfortunately for this documentary, paleontologists now understand that the crest is incomplete. What's been found is only the back of what would have been a full crest, more in line with its relatives, so they probably didn't get picked on in school all the time. When this analysis was done in 2013, some scientists speculated that hollow tubes in what was preserved of the crest would have made it the main passageway for air in these animals. 
This idea didn't get far without those 2013 authors, Prieto, Marquez, and Wagner shooting it down. Michael Raptor makes an appearance here because god forbid we go two episodes without seeing it, but yeah, it's shown living alongside Tarbosaurus in the late Cretaceous. <laughs> Aside from the obvious, yeah, it sports these red and maroon colored feathers, which sure wasn't a bad guess at the time, but still severely outdated. Organelles called melanosomes store pigments that give animals their color. In Microraptor feathers, preserved melanosomes show a strong resemblance to those in black iridescent birds, so they would have been colored in the same way. I should mention the early Cretaceous Titanosauriform Pukyangosaurus that shows up from time to time. As one of the few dinosaurs actually found in Korea, it's unfortunate that since 2016, it has the ominous label of Nomen Dubium, meaning that the genus is no longer valid. This is due to its remains being undiagnostic. All automorphies or distinguishable traits are either too poorly preserved to observe or are shared with other sauropods. It's like that one girl who tries to be different than other girls, but then throws her Starbucks at you when you interrupt her friend's binge, and she literally blames her bad behavior on the month she was born. The last thing I have to say before the rant begins is that theropods, like Tarbosaurus, should have lips. A little controversial, I know. Some of you don't like how they look, but science isn't about what's cool, it's about what is. The subject has been contentious over the years with conflicting research supporting both lipped and lipless conditions, but at this point, the evidence for lips has been more convincing and is more widely accepted as the norm for theropod reconstructions. I'll leave links in the description from paleoartist Mark Witten because I've explained this in previous videos. No need to make half of my episode about lips again. You wanna see me do it again? Okay, even if the lip debate wasn't as settled as today, this Tarbosaurus design is still absolutely abysmal. The mouth looks way too crocodilian, with a rounded mouth rather than having a clearly defined edged mouth where lips would attach. That makes the teeth just jut out all crocodile-like, rather than staying neatly in their sockets where they belong. It's such a nonsensical design. To make matters even worse, the shape of the head feels far less Tarbosaurus and more V-Rex. This abomination is too round, too blunt, and too dummy thick in the head. What a complete fail. The most obvious way to tell apart Tarbosaurus from the very close North American relative Tyrannosaurus is by their skulls. T-Rex has a wider, more heavily built head than its cousin. With its skinnier head, with eyes that face more towards the side, the alarming lizard lacked that superb tyrant binocular vision. Rather than cashing in on terribly inaccurate nostalgia for its depictions, this film should have stuck to the science, to features that make Tarbo unique. So do the problems end here? Man, I miss Prehistoric Planet. The entire first part of Tarbosaurus follows Patch as a youngling, growing up with two siblings. Then part two has him taking care of a family, which he utterly fails at. He goes to get the milk, actually taking his mate, which is a nice turn of events, but the line was too long so the kids wander off and get gulped. Great. The point I'm getting at is how the juveniles serve a crucial role to the documentary with such an abundant amount of screen time, and they look horrible. I really, really hate this dinosaur trope. No, young tyrannosaurids did not look like carbon copies of their parents. They were not little, chunky adults. Even when dinosaurs roamed America got this right seven years prior, their kids should be leaner, sleeker, have longer legs, a longer snout, and more blade-like teeth. Heck, we have specimens of juvenile Tarbosaurus. Paleontologists already knew what they looked like. The filmmakers could have always borrowed from young T. Vex specimens too. Wouldn't have looked exact, but still much better than this. By the movie's second half, Patch is all grown up at 15 years old. Uh, no. A buttload of material has been written on Tarbosaurus, Albertosaurus, Daspletosaurus, Gorgosaurus, and of course Tyrannosaurus. 
This famous family shares a similar growth experience with humans. Life began with slow, steady growth for about the first 10 years. Then in the teens, these creatures ballooned into their larger sizes, but didn't reach full maturity until their early 20s. So Patch being a teenager, well, he should look like a teenager, not an adult. As adults, the Tarbosaurus are said to have reached lengths of 13 meters, which is quite an exaggeration. Even the highest estimates only provide a maximum length of 12 meters. Dang, for a documentary named Tarbosaurus, you would at bare minimum expect them to get the titular dinosaur right, but no, we get this butchered abomination. Even the title, Tarbosaurus the Mightiest Ever, what does that even mean? Mightiest whatever. Animal? Tyrannosaurid, Predator, Dinosaur. We know Tyrannosaurus was larger in length and mass and had a stronger bite. It was a stronger animal. Then maybe if we're comparing it to dinosaurs as a whole, Argentinosaurus is obviously mightier than a Tarbosaurus. It's unspecific, makes no sense, means nothing. It's, it's just dumb. At least the creators tried and failed with this predator on their own. The same cannot be said about Velociraptor. Everything about this species and its portrayal is lifted straight out of Jurassic Park 3. I tried to avoid bringing up this series in my Dino Doc reviews, but the resemblance is uncanny. They're stated to be 2 meters tall, female raptors are cream colored with black striping, Males are dark gray with a red facial display and a long blue stripe running down the length of the body. Their integument only consists of sparse quills. Organized pack hunting is shown. Their killing claws are used to slice prey. It is completely and utterly ridiculous. The only thing we're missing here is... Not complaining about these traits in JP3, that's just a movie, but The Mightiest Ever is a documentary. It's supposed to be educational, yet uses all the same tropes as a Hollywood blockbuster. Not to mention the sheer laziness and dishonesty of copying someone else's work. They stole it from me, Carmine! They took it! That was today! Today! Unfortunately, Centaurosaurus is no better. I can't believe I need to say this, but Hadrosaurids were primarily quadrupeds, walking on all fours. A bipedal stance was taken when they had to sprint, but even then, it looked nothing like what we see here. Centaurosaurus constantly has that tripod kangaroo stance that hurts my soul. Really, their bodies and tails should be parallel to the ground, even when running. That weird stick up the cloaca walk doesn't help their cause either. These guys seem in desperate need of some prune juice. Plus, they're also oversized at 10 meters and 4 tons, rather than their actual size of 8 meters and 2.5 tons. Well, I did compliment the Protoceratops before, and yes, it is the best represented creature here. They have the same problem, said to be 2 meters tall, which is pure insanity. Maybe the narrator means 2 meters in length, but that's not what he said. That's more like Styracosaurus height. Protoceratops were far smaller, at less than a single meter in height. Whoever wrote the script really needed to chill. Stop exaggerating. Therizinosaurus doesn't fare any better. This herbivorous theropod is exaggerated at 7 tons when 5 tons is a more reasonable estimate. Heck, it's not even feathered here. Even, again, when dinosaurs roamed America, recognize that giving therizinosaurids feathers is a no-brainer. I should mention, they fail Velociraptor 2 in this regard, even if their integuments look different. The Therry would have had more downy feathering, while Velociraptor had actual wings, a tail fan, and contour feathers, not just quills. I haven't even mentioned the Hainamichnus, an ichnogenus named from fossil trackways. As fun as it is to include pterosaurs in your paleomedia, building an animal ground up from trace fossils is a risky business, since there are so many blanks to be filled in. Nevertheless, it still has all those bad pterosaur tropes, wings that only extend to the knees, pointy wings, no pick no fiber fuzz. It sucks when documentaries try to have such wide appeal that they dumb down all of their subjects to match audience expectations. If viewers aren't gonna learn anything, then what's the point of making a dino doc in the first place? It's psychotic. They keep creating new ways to celebrate mediocrity. 
None of these shows or movies have ever been great by lowering their standards for mass appeal. No, it's when they bring new, modern ideas in paleontology to light that sets them apart. Alright, alright, let's move on to the setting of this movie, Korea 80 million years ago. Spoiler alert, the only acceptable creature here is the dang Ichnogenus. Pukyongasaurus was discovered in Korea, but lived way earlier in the Cretaceous. Most generously, I can say that this Nomen Dubium came from rocks at least 30 million years older. Microraptor 2 is much older, actually living 120 million years ago. Having it in the late Cretaceous is mind-boggling. Velociraptor and Protoceratops showed up about 5 million years later. One really stupid bit is when the narrator states how Patch's Tarbosaurus ancestors have lived in this place for more than 10 million years. And Patch's descendants will follow in their footsteps for 10 million more. He can't keep getting away with it! He can't keep getting away with it! That would mean Tarbosaurus lived from 90 to 70 million years ago. The fact that this stands out as particularly dumb in a movie full of dumb everything speaks volumes. That would make Tarbo the earliest tyrannosaurid, yet while still being very derived. Any program with even the slightest competence would know that they really lived from about 70 to 66 million years ago at the end of their Cretaceous. Even the volcanic activity attributed to the collision of India into Asia, making the Himalayas, didn't occur until about 55 million years ago. Now, what I have to say next may be controversial, but most of the dinosaurs shown did not live in Korea, or at least they haven't been found there. Velociraptor, Protoceratops, Tarbosaurus, Microraptor, and Syntausaurus all came from either Mongolia or China. That may sound dumb, considering that, like today, what will become Korea was attached to the rest of Asia. I would refute though that animals living today don't just spread across to anywhere they can walk. Ranges can be limited due to a number of factors. And also, a lack of evidence against something doesn't count as evidence for something. That's not how science usually works. You need evidence of an animal living in Korea in order to claim that they lived in Korea, rather than just assuming that they did because no one can prove otherwise. Tarbosaurus has a strange implication when the narrator says this. Though a skillful flyer, this colorful creature is actually a dinosaur, with feathers on her body. This line pretty much implies that birds aren't dinosaurs, since we're supposed to be surprised that this very bird-like flyer is a dino. How did the writers not get the memo that, yes, birds are dinosaurs? Because this video is going on for way too long, I'll have to limit myself to one more complaint. I guess today I'm not slamming the roaring, pronated wrists, or shrink wrapping. Really, it's the narrator's pronunciations of generic names. All this fuss wakes up the Microraptor, a Velociraptor, Therizinosaurus, the Pterosaurus. I don't typically mention this, like, as long as an attempt was made, I don't get too upset, but these were awful. Tarbosaurus the Mightiest Ever is easily one of the worst dinosaur documentaries that I have ever had the misfortune of laying my eyes on. While it may be nostalgic for some, this film clearly displays no interest in presenting prehistoric life in a scientific way. It's so caught up in trying to appeal to the mainstream that it loses any grasp on reality. I can't even recommend this as entertainment. While the detailing is better than bizarre dinosaurs, these are the clunkiest movements I've seen animated. Everything is so fake, so dumb, and so unoriginal, which is why I'm giving Tarbosaurus a well-deserved F. I don't get it. I really don't. A movie on Tarbosaurus should be an easy slam dunk, but I guess not. So now the Asian cousin knows what it's like to be ruined by paleo media. Yeah, there's no way I'm reviewing Speckles. I'm done with this. Remember, if you enjoyed this episode, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.